Oh, just look at that. I don't think I'll sleep tonight. Hmm. I think it's getting a little lighter. Yeah. Dawn won't be far off. Oh, just think of those dawns in Pari. Each one is so different. Sometimes it's so clear you can see every detail for miles. But then sometimes there's a sort of haze over things, as if the earth was still asleep. And then there are those very special dawns, when the hilltop of Pari is floating in a sea of clouds. It, it reminds me, looking into the night sky, that's where it all began. Those questions as a child. Yeah, and the street light outside my bedroom window. My asking if the light went on forever and ever into the blackness, or did it stop somewhere? Was there an end to the universe? There's a child buried deep down in every real scientist. It's the innocence to keep asking questions. Well, the stories, you know, that, that I was told when we made the first encounters, that the elder said, we tried to talk to the white man 500 years ago and he wouldn't listen. But times have changed and I think it's time to talk again and maybe the people we should talk, be talking to are the scientists. And there are things like the seventh fire prophecy, that we have to, either the world will come to an end, Mother Earth will, will die, and, or, or we, have to, we have to light a fire together. So there are various prophecies that, that point to something needs to happen now. So I think that was one motivation to say that we need to talk again. And part of that discussion will be between Western knowledge and traditional knowledge. And our mission is to bring together indigenous ways of knowing and other ways of knowing in dialogue for the purpose of fostering original thought, which is increasingly inclusive, interconnected, and whole. And really, New Mexico is a beautiful place to do this, because New Mexico is really, in many ways, the heart of Native America. I, uh, you know, read lots of science books and so on, and I basically said, geez, you know, I'm not sure if uh, science is really going down the right road. Now, of course, this was my own personal judgment of science. And I wonder if there's, I, it was always in the back of my mind, a big question, and the big question is still with me. And that is, we as humans are, and scientists being out in the front trying to tell us what it's all about, you know, that is looking at the big picture, looking out into the cosmos. Is it possible, is it possible <clears throat> that we could be going down the right road? Is it possible that we could be way out in left field? So, you know, when we talk about native science versus science science, 
I love Greg Cajete's work, you know, and he has his book entitled Native Science. And, and one of the things he talks about in there is, is the background of where science has come from. It's come from the white European male, initially. It's broadened somewhat at this point, but initially that's where it came from. So when we look back at how the, the white European male is raised, um, he says, you know, up until a certain point, um, they are allowed to play and sing and imagine and pretend and play act and romp in the fields and uh, talk with flowers and butterflies if they choose, you know, all of that. But at age five, that must come to an end and we have to get down to the real business of living. And so for in, in that culture, in the European culture, what that meant was suddenly everything had to come up through the intellect. It was all about you know, developing the mind, developing articulation that's all coming out of the mind, um, writing, um, and, and so all of these other ways of knowing, all these other perceptions, and those ways of perceiving, in order to have that kind of knowledge, to have that kind of science, required perception in many, many different ways, in many, many different levels, um, which Western science has not, has, has, you know, adamantly and purposefully kept out as being unscientific. I began to see my own world, it was acted as a mirror for me, and I began to see my own world reflected in it. And I began to see that the things that I held to be, you know, inevitably true, were a set of cultural assumptions. So it really exposed to me that, that the world I lived in, I'd lived in all my life, was based on a set of cultural assumptions, and it wasn't, it wasn't based on inevitability. That's the way things are. It's that's the way we made things. That's the way we see things. Like, um, you know, the, 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 the famous scene in The Wizard of Oz where she goes to the Emerald City and they put a pair of spectacles on her which had green glass in them. So everything she sees is, is green. So it's not that the, that the things in the Emerald City are all green, it's that she's been given a pair of spectacles which makes everything look green. And in the same way I think science was a pair of spectacles that made her see the world in a certain sort of way. And by going to the Sundance and other things, I took the spectacles off and I began to look in a mirror. We have lost our center. And that's what, you know, we can regain, it's possible for all of us to re-indigenize to the land, to become a listener for the spirit of the land to move through us. When that happens, everything shifts, everything shifts. And I feel that is what is happening. You know, there's a renaissance emerging from the land itself. And we could call it a Turtle Island Renaissance, so similar to the European Renaissance before it. The European Renaissance understood that they needed to look backwards to go forwards. And here in Turtle Island, we are also feeling the origin, what we used to call the past, but it's really the origin. That's a place of regenerative growth. That's a place of sustenance. That's a place that is, that is always, always, bringing of spirit. Then there was Taos. But part of that was the act of actually going to Taos, the journey itself. Glenn Parry, he organized the dialogue circles, knew the way to the petroglyphs. They were made by a civilization that stretches back a thousand years Oh, there were so many reasons to stop on that car ride. The mountains, the Rio Grande River, the Virgin of Guadalupe, and then that wonderful church you recognize immediately because of the paintings by Georgia O'Keeffe. This area has such a tradition of artists. As an anthropologist and a student, 
uh, what I'm trying to do for my world, for not just the homo sapiens, but for all my relations, is look into the native philosophies, where they allow it. A lot of natives don't want you to look in, probe into their lives and see see what they've been up to and what they believe because it's 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 their own knowledge and I respect that but there are some cultures that don't mind so I am looking around at all the indigenous peoples which is kind of a blurry term but I guess North American indigenous peoples and South American indigenous peoples to see what they have to offer for this time now. Many indigenous peoples is looking at themselves as being part of this global citizenship. They're they're still looking at they're not still, but they but they see themselves as still being very local. At the same time, they have these cosmologies. You know, I can't say that they don't look at the whole Earth because their cosmology is to look at the Earth as mother. The whole Earth is, is our mother, and we have to take care of her. They have a cosmology that reaches out to the stars. So they, it's, not, it's not about having only a, a microscopic perspective. There's a universal perspective, a cosmic perspective. But that's not somehow addressing this middle ground, which is being global citizen. And I, and I wonder about that, and, and I, as I, I think about, well, how, you know, and, this, and for me this goes back to, you know, something, um, the thought that I had, that if, that if sustainability is the highest technology on the planet, who do you go to? Who are you going to go to for this kind of science about living sustainably in, 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 in a small area on, on the earth, right? Well, of course, you're going to go to indigenous peoples. So suddenly, like, our day has come, right? Where, where what we know is the most sought after knowledge on the planet. So suddenly, these, you know, for instance, uh, the dialogue that, that, that attended recently between Western scientists and indigenous peoples, um, suddenly these conversations are able to take place. Among Indian people, Usually there's a fire, uh, if it's a council meeting, it's a council fire, and that fire represents quite a bit. It represents the energy, it represents uh, uh, a, a, an acknowledgement and an agreement that we're going to speak honestly with each other. So there, the ceremony has a lot to do with how meetings turn out. It's a very, very important part of it. Symbolically, this ball represents the world that we live in, each of these hoops is supporting one another to form this world. But you know what? If I was to take one hoop out, this world would fall apart. seeing science, especially through Einsteinian eyes, I was saying, geez, you know, Western science looks at the world with the idea that God created this vast cosmos, universe, and so on, and that there is an order to it. And that if there's any if there's any chaos, it is us humans that are causing the chaos. And I said, hey, that's very similar to our Native American ways. We talk, but we, you know, we've termed it in the best we can do in English. We refer to it as the flux, 
something, in other words, the flux is the, uh, is the implicit. And we draw from the flux, you know, and try to make some sense, some order out of it through our own cultures. So that was one idea that was very, um, you know, I found the similarities and so on in David Bohm's thinking. Another point was, we had always known that our languages are very process, very uh, action-oriented, whereas England and uh, English and French and, you know, was, you know, European languages are very noun-oriented languages. And so he ended up talking about the uh, real mode in, uh, in his book, Wholeness and the Implicate Order. And what he was saying was, hey, we should try and make our English language a little bit more action-oriented because that's what the uh, that's what the implicate and explicate order is all about. It's all about motion. It's all about movement, and so on. Well, I said, geez, you know, our languages are all have always been about movement. Have always been about motion, and so on. So, I was teasingly, teasingly, uh, telling Boom, hey, Boom, you know, hey, David, if you really want to see the, word, the uh, reality, the way it should be seen and looked at and so on, why don't you learn Blackfoot? It was at that time we were, we, a group of us had organized the very first uh, science conference where we invited <clears throat> our own people and scientists from all over, including, including David Peake. And so that's where it was through David Peet that I was able to make contact with David Bohm. When you think of how you've been inspired by the Bohmian work and the Bohmian dialogues, what, what, um, what stayed with you? What, what lives in you now? One theory was that you know, when the original hunter-gatherer groups used to, they would be living together, they'd sit around the fire at night and his idea was around the fire at night, they would talk about things and whatever would come up would, would come up and, and be resolved and everybody would know what to do the next day. And he wondered what happens if we get, so he thought that sort of number, about 30 to 40 people, 30 to 40 people meet on a regular basis. And first of all, they're gonna be polite. There's gonna be a lot of politeness around. And then gradually the tensions will come up. And, and then I, I think when the tensions came up, he felt, you know, after several weeks, you develop trust. Then the tensions come up, and that then Dave would get sort of a bit more excited at that. When someone is in a group, and uh, instead of just two people talking to each other and arguing, that with the whole group there, there's a sense of, of protection. Yeah. That whatever you could say may not be taken well, but at least you're protected, and everyone protects yeah. the individual. A few days ago we were looking at Catherine Wall's clay sculptures at the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center. Now we're in Hermes Pueblo. And what do you know? This was Catherine's home and her people. It was Phil Duran, and he's both Native American and a physicist, along with his wife Norma, who brought us here. Oh wow, how we feasted when we got here. A feast at the home of Phil's friends, their potters too, and the clay for their pots comes from this amazing land. So then, we went to see the incredible mountains and the rich red earth. A lot of natives are trying to go to this ideal, this traditionalist, purest ideal, which I think is very important for preserving our culture. But I think in this movement towards there, we have to remember that there is a lot, a lot of other things outside of our culture that we can learn from. 
And that's the only thing that's going to save us right now, is if we all pull our resources together. Every tribe, every country, every way of life, to take a serious look at ourselves and reflect, see what we need to keep and what we might need to throw out in order to unite, and also looking at other cultures very critically, seeing what they're doing, how they're subsisting, how they're sustaining themselves, and be open to other ideas. Be open to all the gold that's out there for us to use while still holding on to our own roots simultaneously. And I think that is, um, you know, going to be uh, vital in this in this movement towards pulling ourselves out of this global situation. My hope is at this point we add some consideration for right relations with each other, with our own hearts, with our own ways of perceiving beyond our intellect, uh, with our relationship with, you know, in, in the tradition that I know, we say, for all my relations, we say, mitakuye oyasin, for all my relations. Whatever we do, I hope that we can consider that, that relationship. I think this dialogue isn't just Native Americans and Western scientists, but many traditional peoples talking together and coming together. And I don't quite know how to do that, but I think the time is right for that. So I'm having that discussion there. And even traditional knowledge is also the knowledge that people have in Italy. I always love this bend in the road. You turn, and there, <laughs> you can see Pari below you on the hill. I'll never get tired of that view. I remember my very first day in Pari. We were dropped off in a car, and it seemed at first that we were in the middle of nowhere. But why Pari? Why did we end up here? Was the village a sort of magnet that called to me? Born in Liverpool, years in Canada, then London, and now Pari. Yeah, as you walk around power, you realize it's a container. It's just like an alchemical vessel. These streets are full of memories and stories. And how clean the village is. It's because everybody is proud of Pari. People from here really feel this very close connection to, to the people and, and, and the village. And, and I think that's also one of the reasons why they keep it so well. And they've invested money into the village in the sense of their houses and putting flowers out and everything because they are incredibly proud of where they live. It's always a pleasure to be back in Pari and the Sagra just around the corner. There's be so much to do. So. Now I'm back after a long, long trip. Oh, it's so good to come home, right in time for the Sagra and the Vendemia of the Grapes. There, the key's in the door as usual, and I know who's right behind that door waiting for me. understand where Western uh, the Western world had kind of gone astray um, because uh, the loss of place the loss of a feeling of place the loss of being centered in place had uh, really hampered Western society in ways that they had no idea For Native people, we say traditionally, there, there was no separation between our spiritual life and any other part of our life. It was all one. There was no way to make a decision without engaging spirit. I'm not sitting here talking to you without first having said, 
you know, engage and, and come to spirit and say, you know, this is a chance that I have to, to maybe reach some place that you would have, that you want to reach, you know, so help me, use me. And, and um, that's a very different way of, of approaching things. Uh, you know, we had talked about, um, I, I was comparing um, E equals MC squared, which is, which is an equation that talks about, you know, sometimes, sometimes we're talking about energy, sometimes we're talking about matter. So to me, that's about um, that place where spirit and, and humanity, you know, someone, earth walker, meet. Years since I've seen him. It was actually 1992, 93, I think, last time I saw him. So it's a long time ago. Oh. Was it a Rome. conference? No, no, actually, it, it was like, um, well, the first day I gave a talk and some other people gave talks, and after that it was it was like a circle. So there was a, you know, which is a Native American thing, naturally, you sit in a circle. So there was an inner circle who dialogued together, and an outer circle who listened, and then one evening they sort of swapped round, the circle swapped. But it was essentially meeting in a circle and just talking. It was really great. But um, for the circle itself, because in that circle, you, we begin with um, with smoke, you know, with the, with the eagle feather, and smudge the feather and take it round the room. So the idea is you created this space in which you can talk about sacred things. So you really shouldn't be filming or oh, recording, doing anything like that in that space. But outside the space, that's fine. But not in the space, and not not in other places that are sacred. Yeah, you know, like that connection I had was, was back in the 80s, you know, when Leroy Little Bear phoned me and then, you know, I, I made connections with the Blackfoot people and the Ojibwe and Mi'kmaq and also with the Iroquois were quite different. They were farmers, the other ones were hunters. But, uh, well, one thing in common was this prayer, all my relations. And relations would be people in the tribe, the four-legged, the, four yeah. uh, the plants, the trees. Uh, spirits in the earth, spirits in the sky, the stones. So everything, that sense that everything is, is alive. And then there's that sort of joke bit where the, the white man says, well, yeah, are all stones alive? And they'll say, well, that stone's alive, and that stone over there's alive, and that stone's alive. <laughs> but, you know, something, w when I came to Pari, I got that same sense, you know, maybe that the people here feel connected to the land. So that, uh, the people that I know here, they are still producing uh, with uh, uh, like the, the the grandfather used used to do, and it is something natural. And we want really, first of all, to to maintain this tradition, and also to uh, to try and make them aware why this has been done and what can be improved in order to maintain the environment it is. I'm not of the area and I found and I appreciate it's really that is a natural way still to do things. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and this is something that uh, maybe it's, uh, we have, uh, we, can, uh, we can also learn from, from your, your friends in, uh, in America because they have been done like this from yeah. century. I, I guess another thing is, is like traditional knowledge which, say, Native Americans have, and Australian Aborigines and other people, and the traditional knowledge here, but this sense that everything now has to be measured against Western scientific knowledge, that that's the true knowledge, that's the true thing. And it tends to devalue other things as being, oh, that's just a tradition, or that's a myth, or that's a story. And how do you preserve this balance, that there's a value in traditional knowledge? This traditional knowledge should be, uh, let's say, um, mixed uh, with uh, a little bit more of uh, of some scientific findings, and sometimes, no, into, uh, according to this uh, to this idea, yeah. the uh, re scientific research can help, yeah. no, 
to, to understand and to improve the traditional knowledge to, to do something better. But to maintain, to maintain the, uh, the, the, the vitality of the, of the tradition. You heard some of the uh, Native American uh, people in the circle talking about, I am the environment. I am, I am the land. Okay. You heard them saying that. In English and in European languages, you always need the other. You need me because that's how you identify yourself. When you operate from the other, the land becomes the other thing. And it's, and it, this is complemented by the belief in the Bible that says God created the, the world for the benefit of man. See? And so we've taken on all oh, this was placed here for us, you know, to exploit and so on. So, but thinking at it from the other, we don't have much, uh, we don't have much uh, uh, value. We don't put much value on the other. We can exploit that. So, well, <clears throat> I ask people, when we're thinking about this notion about me and the other, what would happen if we removed the other? If we remove the other, then there would be just me. I become the reference. Well, if I am the reference, then all my feelings, all my views and so on are part of me see so that's why i can say i am the land i am the land yeah it was it was, it was very strange to go to Al albuquerque in that circle because Quite a lot of time had elapsed. Uh, I, I left uh, North America in 1994, and when I left, I'd sort of, in a sense, severed those connections with, with the native people I knew. And I also knew that uh, Leroy did come over to attend the memorial meeting for David Bohm, but said, you know, that these sacred things, you say them when you're in, uh, on the land, and when you're away from it, maybe you don't talk about them anymore. So that was my feeling. I'd left that, I'd come to another place where there were other connections, but I'd lost, I felt I'd lost that connection with Native America. And then I went back to the circle. So I think this dialogue isn't just Native Americans and Western scientists, but many traditional peoples talking together and coming together. And I don't quite know how to do that, but I think the time is right for that. Are we going to survive on the earth? Uh, it's, it's not, and it's not just Indigenous people are asking those questions. Uh, Goethe asked them some time ago, and, and Goethe said that Western science always puts nature in artificial situations in the laboratory. But what if we had a dialogue with nature? What if we spoke to nature? And if we did, we would learn from nature, but nature's also learning from us, and nature would provide us with the example worth a thousand. There's some people here who have incredible knowledge of, um, of everything from the moon to the sun to the earth to the animals around, to the insects that they see, to the plants that grow here. And the young people don't want to know about that. They're totally rejecting it. They, they want to work in the city, they want computers, and they want to feel normal in respect to their friends who are in the cities. So I think that's that's very sad because all of the knowledge that these older people have is going to be lost. It was just 
the sign proposed? Um, well, not exactly. There, were, there was sort of be a tradition for, for different sort of dances. And some dances emerge out of people working together. They found it easier to actually dance together rather than just do all this sort of hard work and, and maybe to sing while they dance. And, you know, in, in our culture we have sea shanties. You know, when, when sailors were pulling on ropes, they found it easier to sing together. So in a sense it's a tradition and you pass it on and you pass it on and you pass it on. So this is all based on nature? It would have a big strong connection to nature, yeah. It would, it would. And this one, the, the guy that's dancing now, he, this is a war dance. Mm -hmm. And then after we see another dance, which is hoop dance, where, where a person dances a number of hoops, collects them together and makes them into a spear. Mm -hmm. So the dances symbolize something. And these are dances that anybody can participate in and watch, but it's not the same as, as a sacred dance. We've got, of course, you have to have get permission to use this in the film. You know. In a way, that's part, of, that's, that's a part of their tradition. It's part of their knowledge. So, you know, I think there are people now who, who'd like to find some way of returning to that or, or making a connection with it. And also you, I mean, when you're going to do your dance, so the one that's your dance, that's unique. It may look the same to other people, but there'll be something inside you, inside your spirit that's different. Space and time are the other. Most people mistake science for technology, but technology is not science. Technology is not science. The thing is, but if a person really wants to know, see, well then it should be about science. Science in a broad sense, in other words, pursuit of knowledge. So all the technology that we have today was known 50, 60 years ago. In other words, technology is only catching up. The youth are developing a relationship with, with their technological toys. They are not developing relationships with people. And they're not developing relationships with the environment. What technology does, and that's what you can find that on the computers and so on, all you have to do is Google and so on. All you get is facts, 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 facts. But what the younger people do not know is how do I arrange those facts so that they make sense? See? So in other words, the younger people don't know how to think anymore. You know? All they get is facts, 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 facts. My generation is being controlled by the media. They're being controlled by their addiction to like food that's mass produced. They're, they're addicted to a lot of horrible things. And a lot of us look around and say, oh wow, you know, this isn't right, we need to change it. And there's a big, huge group of youth who are studying environmental science, <clears throat> going to climate change conferences, and all kinds of humanitarian uh, endeavors. There's a huge group of them. However, I'm sad to say, I think we might still be the minority. We might be half of, of all the youth. And the other half, in, from my eyes, are asleep. <laughs> the 
Yeah, this weekend it's uh, Paris Sagre. It's the Sagre de la Salsicha. That's the festival of the sausage. And every village in this area has its own festival. It has a festival on the weekend, and people come from all over. And it's a way that the village makes a little money to, to subsidize its events during the following year. But it's also, I think, you know, a little bit like the Sundance. I mean, some of the Blackfoot told me that the Sundance was a way which people would interact and meet each other. I think the same thing happens here. So the, the, the festival is a really important thing, this Sagra, and everybody's working towards it for weeks ahead. And uh, at the moment, what we're doing here is we're cooking the, the, the dolce, the, the desserts. There is a cookbook called Doses. And it's a set of doses of, of how much you need for each thing. But it doesn't tell you how you cook the thing. It, and that's the practica. That's what you have to learn. You, you have to actually learn it on the job. So, so the cookbook just tells you the amount you need, but it doesn't tell you how to cook it. And how to cook it is something you learn. And, uh, you know, if you want to go back to Native America, that would be coming to knowing how you learn to, to know to do something. It's something you have to learn. And the other stuff can be written down. So there's sort of two sorts of knowledge. There's a knowledge that is written down in a book and the knowledge you learn by observing and participating. scientific knowledge which has brought many great benefits but also great dangers such as the danger of nuclear war destruction of natural resources oh, I, I, I think you better wake up now um, it, it's me it, it's David listen to me it's funny I heard Bomb's voice in my dreams and, and now you turn up it, it's almost like looking in a mirror. Oh, you're just a bad dream. Just I'm go not away. a dream. You've got to wake up and see where you really are. Oh, what's going on? Get me out of here. Look at you. Look at the stage you're in. You are just a faker. And what about your famous Western science? Oh, it's culture-free, it's quantitative, it's objective, it's wonderful, it's wonderful. So what's all that got to do with Native Americans and eagle feathers? It was never that simple, it wasn't that obvious. I mean, like, we were, we're, we're human beings and scientists, we live in society, and, and the society suggests questions, and, you know, we ask them, but, so it's a good idea to know about other cultures, other forms of knowledge, because it maybe tells us the limitations of our own. So please, please just let me go. Oh, all right, go back to your laboratory. No, I can't go back. It's too late for that. If you really want to take me on the path, then you do need... Given answers, 
And the answer that was given to them was simple. Follow the good red road. What we need to do, it's not a technological thing that we have to do. We have to clean our houses, that is our mental houses, clean them out, and have a new way of thinking, and not have the other anymore, so that it's just me. And when it's just me, then a whole different way of thinking, a whole different approach will, will take place. picked up the phone and a voice said, this is Leroy Littlebird, I'd like to speak to David Pete. And this person invited me to go to a circle with Native Americans. I booked my ticket, I got the air ticket, and the day I was supposed to go, I just chickened out. I thought if I go, this is gonna change my life. The thing about Pari is, it gives you a real sense of place. Um, my kids also think of it as a, a place that's very safe that when they come back to party or they see it when we've been away and they see it over in the distance and they scream, it's party, it's home. But the original, the original building goes back in 15, 1505, no? Was this one made up by the monks. When I read David Bohm's works, I, I began to say, geez, hey, here's a scientist that's saying the same thing or similar things to what my people say and what I've been saying about science. And so I kept saying in the back of my mind, wouldn't it be great if I can meet this man? It's taken a long time for, for uh, Americans on this continent to begin to feel the spirit of the place. I'm a tribal member, but I'm also a global citizen. I have to be at this point. Is that where the physics comes in to the whole idea of dialogue? And you knew you knew David Bone for a while, right? Oh yeah, yeah. And did you notice over time with his interest in language that he experimented and changed his own way of languaging the world. There's a lot of disharmony from my eyes in the world. And a lot of that disharmony could be cured with indigenous wisdom.
Uh, you know, Einstein, Einstein very felt very affectionate towards David Bohm, and uh, he once said that he saw uh, Bohm as being his spiritual son. But his legacy lives on. The uh, the fire was kindled, the fire was started, and so on, and we attempted to uh, carry on his work by continuing to hold these dialogues and continue to explore uh, science from both a, a Western and a Native American uh, perspective.